All right, everybody, welcome back. This is Phil Demetriotis here. I want to do a demo today for some of my students to talk about options for coloring characters. Um, I already have a couple other demos that I'll put back up that are linked up on my YouTube site, but I wanted to talk a little bit about some characters and styles. And before we even dive into that, one thing that's really important is there's so much great work out there. Let's start off by taking a look at some famous artists and look at some different styles, okay? I've pretty much broke down in my opinion, the stylistic approach to three variations. And let me go ahead and I'll write this down for you in Photoshop. This is a, a character I roughed out in a minute, in, in two seconds, literally. I'm gonna paint over this guy today and I'll go over a couple basics, okay? But real quick, let me write down what I've noticed just from being in the industry, okay, and from working uh, with other artists, what those three variations are, okay? So there's sort of three variations and they're actually pretty simple. One, step number one, is a black line, okay? I was writing BLK there, but let me just go ahead and write it in correctly, okay? Black line, all right? And then underneath your black line, you come in and you place color, okay? Now your color can have different variations. There can be color in terms of texture. There could be color in terms of gradations or gradients. Okay, we'll talk about that in a minute, okay? Step number two, all right? So the three variations for color and character. Uh, step number two is going to be when we have line, but the line becomes um, thinned out or we're going to delineate the line and we lose the quality of the line, okay? So the line can therefore become, I'm going to put in here thin or delineated, okay? And I'm not going to write delineated because I suck at spelling, okay? But I know how to use it in terms of vocabulary. Slash color, meaning that we change the black line to a color line and then we reduce it and then we can then come back and we can erase the line around certain areas that we want, allowing the value of the character to show. The third variation of coloring a character is when we have no line and we end up having shape and the shape reads, okay? So, and if you come back and you go back through a couple of these, I can just write down a couple styles. When I was at Disney, I worked on a Winnie the Pooh style. Okay, Winnie the Pooh is line. Sorry, my Cintiq is wigging out right there. See that, I was writing and it did a straight line. It's line with watercolor underneath, okay? Some of you might also notice another particular artist that has that type of style with line and markers and sort of watercolor feel is Nico Marley, okay? Um, another show, 101 Dalmatians back from the day. All right, that show was line with bright or, or slash subdued color underneath, okay? Um, line with thin color or erased line well, that's used commonly all over animation and so on. And part of the reason for that is why. It's because black line can kill or flatten an image. Okay, it absolutely does, 100%. No line is great because then you see just the character, the shapes, and the color. And let me show you a couple examples really quick while I have the recorder up, okay? So I went searching around. I just grabbed a couple artists. I found this artist, Diana Hugh, um, or who I think. We'll take a look at her work. I just came across this when I was doing some search, right? Here's some nice character sheets of hers. And so what you're gonna see here is you're gonna see a really basic, this is, goes into the category number one, where you see a really basic line with just with a straight fill of a color. Now, one of the things you can do in that category one is you can select the local color that's down there and then you put an indication of shadow. So if you see like right here along the breast line, right here along the side of the dress, that's what's being done there after you put in a local color. So let me come over here and write that down on my sloppy writing here. Oops, let's bring that out of full screen. Let me come back to Photoshop really quick. And so I was writing down some samples here, right? And I'll go over this paper a little bit more for you and finesse it up, okay? But when we look over here, one of the examples that you can do, we have line with, um, actually, instead of equal, hold on, let me adjust that brush. So we have line here, okay, with just local color. And then I'm going to put simple shadows. Okay, and the way to do the shadows, it's really easy. You literally just select 
part of the body that would be in shadow. You imagine light coming from one direction, let's say the left side, then you go in and you just select it. Now, you can select it with a lasso or you could just take a brush and go in and stroke around with a brush and paint it on and get it to blend in. It's a simple, easy approach to show colors. It works fantastic every time, okay? Um, here's another one of her pieces that I found too. I thought was really cool. Same sort of process, basic color, lights coming from this side because you can see shadow, shadow, shadow. A nice thin and thick black line okay now black line can be different right when you look at different types of shows you can have really thick heavy black line that might be one particular style for a show and then you can also have really nice thick and thin line I tend you guys that have had me before in my classes I tend to side on nice thick and thin line that has a good adjustment of what we call contour line moving around corners going thick to thin that reads a lot easier Okay, next in the lineup here, um, I'm going to show you two of our students too that do really great work and um, we've gone over some of this with them before, but I just want to, I found some other work online. I found this guy right here and I thought this is pretty cool. Let me zoom in here. It didn't have a name, it just it was on DeviantArt. Here's a great example of number three. Number three is where we have just shape. So this, what's really cool about working this way is just taking the lasso tool, you can go over your line and then select an area and then boom, you just fill it with color. Then you come back and then you can fill little quadrants or areas with little gradients or you can select part of an area and then just darken it with levels or paint on top of it, okay? But remember in, in terms of painting, there's sort of two different approaches to putting a shadow on an object. We can take the lasso and make a selection and then just go to levels and darken it or paint in there. Or we can get what I call painterly, which is where you start to paint something and then you start to render and that's when you're blending multiple colors together. This is a great, simple, easy approach because look at the visual read here. It's really simple, the shapes read. Um, it doesn't take that long. What's also really cool about this, if you do this on separate layers, um, even if you didn't do it on separate layers, once you have this selection like painted in as orange, you could come back and select an area really easily and just hit it with red and paint over it and make dark and light um, suggestions inside that. But that's a great example of just shape, okay? Um, let's come back here. So let me show you a couple other artists, all right? This is Daniel Lopez Munez, okay? I, uh, he was a big idea when I was there for a little bit. He's now at Pixar. He's one of the head designers, really talented guy, okay? Daniel loves to work with, because I've seen him work, because he was trained by my boss, Michael Spooner, who was one of our guest speakers, right? Um, he loves to work with line and with Prismacolor pencil, but what he does, it's so great, and I saw him do this a couple times in some of his work for us, which secretively, I have a couple of secret images for a project we did that like no one's ever seen. I have him home a disc, I can bring him in and show him to you. He's a super nice guy, he's super talented, okay? Daniel would take his line drawings, I don't know if you can notice this, but you see how the line drawing on this character is a little bit more brown, it's not quite black? He takes his line drawing and either runs it through a channel or has it on a selected layer and then changes the color of the line drawing from black to something a little bit light. Because what does black do? It can flatten an image, absolutely. So if we run down and if we go a little bit, uh, change the color of the line from black, that could really have a different feel on the character. And what's really cool, it's hard for me to sort of zoom into this because it's a low res copy, but even if you look at the nose, that nose isn't quite black. There's a little bit of red in that line. So you could actually select part of your line. This goes down to number two. So the sample I, I mentioned right here in Photoshop of number two is when you have line, thin line color, but you're also erasing part of the line or changing the color of the line. So right here, when I put color, I'll put color of line, okay? You're changing the color of the line, then filling it with colors underneath, and that this is sort of a good sample of what you get. But what's really cool, what I would highly recommend, a lot of you guys, you know, I really promote your rough drawing and sketches. Why? Because you have a lot of energy in those drawings. So another great artist who we all know who does this, let me pull him up really quick, who works with his line drawing, okay, is Peter Desev. Or Peter Desev, however you want to call him. All right, so if we come over here, let's look on images right here, and we'll click an image like this, okay. Whoa, there we go. It evolved right in front of us, okay. That was pretty cool. But look at the black line drawing that's in there in the color. Okay, so he's more number one. 
he keeps this rough sketch that has a lot of energy in there, but then he's coming back underneath and he's placing sort of watercolorish washes, and I believe he does come back with some Prismacolor pencils, okay? Um, so if you go look at some of his illustration work or if you look at his animation work that he's done for various studios, very high energy. He has the black line, which is probably like a Prismacolor or color or uh, just a, a normal um, pencil, but he works not with a sharp tip on the pencil, with a dull end on the pencil. Why? You get nice and loose and it forces you not to get into any detail. Then he comes back underneath and puts all kinds of really loose sort of color work and feel. That was old stuff from Nemo, right? Uh, I mean, Peter's awesome because he has a lot of energy in his work. And, and just because we're working in Photoshop, that does not mean there are a lot of brushes that feel just like pencil. You can have the same type of energy that's communicating into your work as well. Okay. All right. Let's go back here then. Let's come back. And I didn't mean to jump topic there. Let's go back. Here's two more pieces from Danielle. Okay. Um, here's another one. Okay. From up. And so you're going to see that I think this is a good example of number two because see some of the black line along the character here? But then look at the pants. What color are the pant line right there? They're the color of the pants. They're just a little bit darker to hold the value of the pants together. Do you see that? But they're not quite, here you have like a dark line around that jacket. Why? Because it's a darker color. It's a darker jacket. That makes sense. So when you get to the hands, he probably, look, he has some of the same color there. But then look at this color in here on the pants. So you can go in. This is a great example of number two because he's changing part of the line color to affect the character. So you guys are going to decide, you know, what color the jackets might be, the outfits, and so on. So you guys, our project was to design characters for Incredibles 2. So if you have a character that has a red suit on with yellow, you're not going to have maybe black line around that yellow. It might be in your best interest to load the line layer separately, select part of that area, and maybe make it a darker yellow versus the rest of the suit might be a darker red. You could totally do that, and it's really easy. I'm going to show you how to do that in just a minute or two here, okay? Um, all right, let's close him down, okay? And let's take a look. Who else? I had a bunch of other designers here. So another one of our guest speakers, my buddy David Coleman, right? Uh, really popular um, style, great energy. So he draws with Prismacolor pencil on a variety of different services and probably some blunt pencils. And the thing you're going to notice about him is he just comes in. This is a great example of just a flat color. That's just one flat color and under the piece. He's not going in and cleaning up. Why is he not cleaning up that cat and coming in and putting a big thick and thin contour line over that, which would be step one? Why? Because he's going to kill the energy in the drawing. There's a lot of energy in that drawing right now, and that came from a rough sketch and him working with Prismacolor. So a, a really great tactic, I'm going to go over this in the, in the visual development class next semester, a really great way to draw is to rough with Prismacolor pencil on different surfaces, okay? John Navarez uses animation paper. I still prefer tracing paper. Animation paper is fun too. I just can't erase it all the way. Daniel Lopez uses vellum and tracing paper. Okay, those are really fantastic techniques that you could communicate. But look, all you have to do for a character pitch is just throw local color under there. And if you wanted to get technical in Photoshop, I could come in here on the color layer, pretend the light's coming from the left side, and just select areas of shadow. So where would be like an area of shadow on that cat? And by the way, if you do take an image of, a, let's say you have a sheet of characters like this, have the light direction come from the same on all the characters so it matches the entire sheet. So if I were to say light's coming from the left here, I could come in here and select like the side of this of his puffy face right here, and I might put that. Just I could select that. I could select a couple parts of the tail. You know, I could select the side of the sphere of the paw. I could select this side right in here. And I could just really easily one of two things: select a new layer, sample that color, darken it a little bit, go over it with a brush, go over it with a texture, or go into levels and just move the level slider over and just lightly darken it really quickly. Okay. All right. So that's David. He was another one of our guest speakers here at school. Fantastic guy. Um, I found this girl's work too. Her name is Kendra Melton, just to give her credit for it. Um, black line, simple color underneath. Now, this is a little bit more of a stylistic approach or show. Again, be careful that black line can flatten something. Here's a great example, though, where she has rough sketches, simple color underneath, but you're not seeing any gradients on that character, right? You're not seeing the sense of where light's coming from. And that's really easy to do. 
It's just coming in with the selection tool. It takes a little bit more time. Okay, I found this uh, stylistically. I thought this would be cool. I found this artist. Her name is Kim Yacento. Um, I was just, you know, doing a Google search on basic character designs. And what I thought was really cool about this, if we zoom in there, okay, there's a little bit of line that's really thin, but then you can also look. It looks like the line is changing color here to match that gray. Does that make sense? So this guy has like a brown line around the pants. That line doesn't feel like black. Or if it is black, it's very, very thin and very hard to see. So that's a, this is sort of a great example of number two, where you're taking line that's around a character, and as you build the color and the values underneath, you start to turn that line down from 100% down to you know 70 to 50 to end up to about 20 or 15 when you're done, which a lot of you probably do that. You've already been doing number two because you see how strong that line quality can be. Okay. All right, so let's go back here. And of course, I want to show you two of our students. Okay, so, um, oh, I'm sorry, before we go to Maddie and Christina, I had Pascal up here. And so you guys all know who Pascal Campion is. He's an amazing designer. So a lot of his work, there's limited line, it's shape. So he's sort of doing that shape thing, okay? Um, and I think a no one of our students that was really inspired that was Christina. Cornette, and I'll show you her work in just a minute. She sort of does a mixture of one and three. Let's take a look at Maddie's too really quick because Maddie is just a great designer. She does really fantastic work. But she has a certain style, which I'm going to call a little bit more TV-based, right? But this is an example of just like a baseline. She's coming in with simple color and throwing it underneath. Boom. Simple, easy. She doesn't have any direction of light or shadow coming in. Now, occasionally, she'll do something you know, like, see that this color on the boy's head? The reason why she put a little bit of that, that brown, that sort of that warm brown against that black, why? Because if it was pure black, it would totally flatten out the character. It wouldn't look right. So by having a little bit of warm coming on the top of that character, but you see, by using just a simple gradient or a light airbrush in Photoshop, she was able to change the look and feel of that particular character and give a little bit more volume to the character. But the rest of these, look, maybe on the knees there, she made them a little darker, but she didn't put any real other indication of light coming from a particular angle. So, so when I tell you guys I want you to color your characters, it could be as simple as just filling color underneath a line drawing. Because look at how nice that looks. It could be as simple as doing what David Coleman did, right? Here's another one of Maddie's character. So again, uh, black line, thick and thin contour, bright saturated colors to pop underneath. If those colors become too subdued, and when we're talking about you know colors, let me just go over this with you. Bring up the color picker here. This is sat saturation right here. So subdued is when we start getting colors. Look at this color here. It goes into really light color. If you have really light, this is what I call pastel colors on this side. If you have really light soft pastel colors in a thick black line, that black line is going to dominate the colors. It's in your best interest then to go back and to thin down that line quality. So Maddie tends to do this thing where she jumps into, up into saturated colors. Okay, why? Because it, it makes the black line become, it knocks it back a little bit and makes it, you know, it just works with the image a little bit easier. Okay, all right, so let's go through here. Maddie's stuff is great, really talented, right? Um, all my students are talented. Okay, let's go to Christina though. Okay, I want to show you Christina's stuff because some of you haven't seen or know some of the style. Christina, what was really cool is I feel sort of honored because I had her back in my classes like three and a half years ago when she couldn't, like she didn't draw, she drew, but she didn't know a lot of technique. And one of the techniques I showed her way back in the day with sketching for animators and illustrators was working on tracing paper with color erase pencils and Prismacolor pencils. She really took to that very quickly and she was able to develop some really cool styles from that. After doing that, she was also able to develop her style into this sort of shape oriented style, which not too many artists are doing or pulling off correctly. She's pulling it off very nicely, as you can see by this, because look, there's no defined edges in her work, okay? In fact, in some areas, she gets lost and found edges. Remember, we were taking a look at David Coleman's work. Excuse me, David Coleman. Um, oh gosh, Carter Goodrich's work, right? And we were looking at how he didn't have a defined line and he had a broken up line around there. It gets the drawing to breathe. Christina's doing that, but she's also moving into color and she's developed sort of her own style. But at the same time, so she's 
pretty much in the number three category, but there's some of her other work, and this is a great example of number three where there's really not much lying. If there is, she doled it down to a really light gray to hold the character together. But when she's painting in here, she's using tools to blend. So what do we talk about with blending? We're talking about having grays with a little bit of pink or coming in with an airbrush and getting that to blend in. So you're getting these really soft transitions in her work. Okay, and look, I mean, look, this is just, I think that's what makes this character because this is a little baby dinosaur. So when you think of a baby dinosaur, do you want to have a hard edge? No, you want to have babies are soft. So why not have soft little transitions inside that character? It matches that style a little bit more, especially up in here. You can have numerous, look, you have a dedicated highlight. You have, a, you have light coming from a direction. You have a, a lighter surface here, a darker surface under here. The eyeball has a highlight on it. You have a, a little coarse shadow under there. Look, there's even reflective light. There's a white reflective light under there. Because any of you that have had basic drawing or had me in other rendering classes, we know that we always have, we have light coming from a direction, we have a highlight, we have a core shadow, and then we have reflective light or bounce light that comes back. Okay, she's doing that here on some of the teeth. Look at this tooth with the highlight there. And then look, a little bit of white reflective light down there on the bottom to get that tooth to pop out so it doesn't become so stagnant and so locked in with the top of that character, okay? Uh, this is great because this is just simple, no outside line, simple shape. She's doing a little bit of blending. She's also coming in doing a little bit of um, texture, having those little dots on there. She's hitting it with some brushes to have some dark sides in there. Okay, so it's up to you. You can go. Now, our project was The Incredibles. If you go look at Lou Romano's stuff, he's working in style number three. Okay, so I hate to have to put like numbers of styles on there but it's sort of true when you look at all the work you're gonna see that there's sort of a basic okay um let's go look up Lou Romano oop there we go Lou Romano here let's go to images oh gosh not Lou Romano um yeah that's him I'm not seeing yeah here it is um so I, I think he's a great designer uh to me he has a little bit of uh um, Hirschfield combined in there with his style and approaches. He's, he worked on Incredibles with a bunch of other designers. Um, but look, there's no line, lots of really cool shapes. See how it really strong colors against black con contrasting, but no line to flatten anything out, right? Um, it, I, I know some of you are like, he's at Pixar? Yeah, of course he is. He has a really cool style that's really simple that reads well sometimes for development because he doesn't caught up he doesn't get caught up in all the artificial detail that you don't have to have. He has a tendency to just focus on some of the simplicities. And there's something really nice about this sort of, to me, Mary Blair is the person that sort of invented it. Um, and so did um, Ivan Earl. Okay. Um, Ivan Earl was another Disney designer from back in the day. Here, let me show you some of his stuff. So probably screw up the name. Ivan Earl. Okay, so these are sort of styles that have proceeded over the years, right? I mean, Ivan Earl had this sort of really graphic approach. Okay, let me go back there. Um, he had sort of this graphic approach with shapes. There we go. See if you can see that one right there. Okay. But look at that. That's a hillside with trees with little cows on it, right? very stylized but then he also was able to come back into his stylization and he was able to add lots of little granular details that really got the work to pop out too like look at this piece here look at how beautiful and stylized that is look at those little you know little tree colors in here look at that look at all the perspective lines coming back straight to one point and then look at the atmospheric perspective in there right but look at all the little detail in the colors. Look at the, you have the, the, the light greens, the bright greens, some dark greens. You have some autumn, some warm colors in there. Look at that. Look at how detailed that is. So what I really like about Ivan Earl is that he had a way of getting in there and, and having basic, simple shapes. But then you could also get really complex on that, okay? And some other artists that we've been looking at all through this semester for various reasons, okay, is if we go back to Creature Box. 
And if you take a look at some of their styles, okay, they're like crossing over all areas, but they have some really specific design fundamentals. Okay, number one, um, I want just that image there I just saw. Let's just see if we get the image without, there we go. I mean, number one with Creature Box, I mean, you, you have ex extreme use of shapes, right? Um, you have the line having some variations in it. I mean, look at how, how much warmer the line gets right here as compared to where it is there. So they are changing the color of the line, whether they're painting on it or whatever. There are some variants happening. But when you look at this bird, that bird's a great example of just a local color and then selecting a shadow area and that's it, boom. So they do a mixture of different emphasis inside their work. They also are really great at selecting little areas. So they start with a base color, they come back in, they select a little area, they make it like a shadow color, then they come back in, they throw a texture on it to get it to read, like these little dots in here, like these little speckles and dots here. Then they come back and then they put little highlights on things to get it to pop. So they're almost doing like a combination of all three, okay, of those aspects, okay? All right, so with that said and done, there's a lot of great reference there, and um, you know some of our students have done really well, especially I mean, look at how this transfers again the benefit of drawing in your sketchbook, right? Christina's Christina spent a lot of time with line, but how how could you transfer this even traditionally? Well, get a color eraser pencil like that's like a red, draw with that red, and then when you go over it with markers and paint, you're losing the line, right? The shape is coming together. Every one of you could still do that, okay? So. Let me show you a couple of basics here. Some of this I might have to continue home because it's a lot of information to cover, okay? So first things first, let's go to this, this horrible drawing that I did right here, okay? Um, now, just we can use this for a basic demo because it's really simple. Something that I like to do in my work that I would highly recommend to all you guys is first label your stuff. And the other thing that I do, if I want to change this line quality, I drew them in blue for a reason, okay? If I want to change this, I always keep my line as original. So I might label this as line ORG. The reason why is if I come into this line and I start changing them to black and, and then adjusting the value selections, it changes the quality of that particular layer and I might not be able to go back to it. I'd have to go back to the original scan. It saves me a lot of time if I just duplicate that layer and then if I come in here, I can easily put the original up there and come back here, take off copy and ridge that's just my line I'm going to use now okay and so if I come in here I look I can just go to levels really quick and um, oops actually I went to go to hue and saturation and I could literally suck out the quality of that line the blue in it just by going to saturation like this and if I move this down towards the end here where there's no color okay it just turned it to a black line you see that okay some, some people go in and they go under image adjustments, turn it to black and white. Well, I don't do that because I still might be working in color. So now I have that line selected, okay? But the, the other reason why I made that copy is sometimes people go into levels like this or into curves and they start adjusting the line like so. So if you do this, and let's say you really thin down that line, if you go back to that and you've made a lot of alterations like in levels or curves, it's hard to get that drawing to go back to its original versus boom, right there I have the original still. Okay, saves you a lot of time. All right, so a couple, and, and I wanna actually command Z there, I want him a little darker. So let's talk about a couple basics uh, first on how I could change my line color. There's a couple really simple, easy approaches. Okay, number one, I have my line here on a separate layer, right? Always great to think about when you're working. It's literally this easy, easy. select all, hit the move tool which is V, hit an arrow, boom, and now my line selected. It selected all the line right there, okay? That's one option you could do. So what I can do now is if I were to say control H, which I hid my selection, I turn off the line, I come back here, I create a new layer, I'm gonna label this color line, and I'm gonna come back over here, and let's pick like a darker red, okay? Like so. And now here's the cool thing, is that I can, I have a couple options. One, I have a hotkey on here to fill. If I hit Control F, fill with foreground color, boom, my, light, my line is now filled as red, right? However, let's say if I had a character, let's say on his feet, I don't want to fill his feet, right? 
well, look, I could still come in here. Maybe his feet are going to be a yellow color, like so. So I want to make his feet a darker yellow like this. I still have the selection. Do you see that? So now I could come in and paint part of his feet color if I want, because I have that base selection. Okay. So that's one simple approach that I could do is I'm just changing the color of the line right now. Okay. What's another way that we could change line color? So let me hit deselect. Let's go back to our original line. Another way is select in color range right here. Color range gives us the ability to touch a particular value here and it will select that value. If I come over here to color range and touch white, it'll select all the white inside the line and I can delete the white. So if you scan, that's really useful for you because if you scan an image from your sketchbook and you want to get rid of the, the, the paper or the color on the back, that's a great approach. I can also come over here, watch what happens if I touch the black of his eye. Hit OK. See it selected the line. However though, Photoshop does have a hard time sometimes reading really light lines. So it's, see it's not quite reading part of the line in there, but let's see what it did catch. Okay, so I'm going to tank that off. Okay, and look, you can see right here in the selection. But Photoshop does this thing where sometimes it doesn't show you the selection, but it's still selected. Okay, so now if I come in on another layer here, and if I color with this, I have a gray there selected. So you can see what happened in that. It didn't quite select that. So that's another option for line selection. If you're going to do line selection, you're going to do that select tool. Usually your image has to be a little bit darker, the line has to be a little bit darker so Photoshop can read it, okay? All right, so here, let me delete that. Let's delete what's there. Actually, let me just delete the layer. I'm gonna deselect, delete this layer. I'm gonna show you, there's a, and so that's two approaches. What's another way you can select line? Well, you ready for this one? Okay, I have a line right here, the character. I select all, hit the move tool. I've selected the line. Let's say I want to load the line up all the time, but I don't have to go back and make this selection all the time. Well, what you could do, I don't use paths out often, but I could come into here. Here, I'm going to, I'm going to take the selection off right now. The, the selection's there, but I'm taking off the line at work. Excuse me. I'm going to go to paths, and right here, I can create a new path like this. Okay? And then I could tell it right here to, um, if I come down here and click this little target, It'll put that selection in the path. You see that? It made that selection for me by hitting that little target option. So look what happens if I click off the path. I have nothing there, right? So look, I'm going to come in here. Let's put a new layer in. If I go back to my paths, I can click on that path, and then I can say make selection. And then it'll bring up this little make selection, anti-alist, how many pixels. Is it OK? There's my selection. OK? So that's a third way that you can get that selection. Now you can load it all the time. So what does that mean? That means you can select part of your character, like the eyes or the hands, and you can just go back and keep loading the selection all the time, which is pretty cool. It's extremely useful. So now look, I could be working on my character. Um, let's go back to that red here. And if I hit Control H, I'm just going to hide my ants. See that? Boom. So I could be working on them, and then I'd be like, OK, I don't need that anymore. Now I'm going to go work on the character itself. And then if I decide, I click on the other path, OK? Deselect, if I come back in the layers. See, I could be working or drawing or adding something else. Anytime I want, I come back to my path, I click that path, I right click on it and tell it to make selection, hit OK, boom, the selection's there. Now, there's another way, because there's something else. There's another really great way. It's the power of the force. Okay, I'm going to teach you a Jedi trick here. It's something that I was taught, and it's still the way I like to work. It can be a little confusing. I'm going to show you real quick. Select all, delete. Um, let's just delete the layer, okay? And add another layer here. So this is the way it's called. It's using channels. Channels can be really confusing. I even still can screw it up sometimes. There's my line. Select all, V, hit the move tool, okay? Once I have a selection done, any selection. I could bring that into channels. Let's go over this really quick. Channels can be really confusing. Heck, I could, and I'll probably do this so fast, I could come back and just do a whole separate lecture just on channels, okay? If I come over here and click channels, all right? I have red, green, blue, and all this good stuff here, okay? What I'm gonna do right now is come back to layer here. I'm gonna turn off the line so I can't see it. Let's go to channels. If I click a new channel here, you see that? It goes all black. 
all right? And, and this is where it gets a little touchy sometimes where you can make mistakes with channels. On channels, I can turn on the red and it becomes like a ruby lift, okay? When it's red, I have my colors over here change to white and black, okay? I'm gonna hide my ants right now, right? White would be a selected area. So if I go to the brush, see what happens now? I'm painting over my selection that I just brought over. Do you see that? So there, I painted over my selection. So guess what I've just done right now? I can load that, anything that's in white will be selected. You see that? So I can load that selection from the channel selection anytime the same way I did the path. However, the really cool thing about channels is that I could also come in here and now if I want to, if I hit, remember I have the selection, if I hit deselect, I could erase all this out too, okay? And I could add it back in really easily. So with channels, I can make numerous selections very quickly, copy and paste a selection in, and I could alter it. And here's the best thing about channels. Remember I'm in white now? If I switch to this dark color, I'm taking something out of channels. Do you see that? So I could take a selection out. So what does that mean? Let me back up here. That means if I'm working on my character and I want to make a special selection for just the eye and be able to pull the eye in and paint on top of it, I can load the general selection of my line. I could then come back now and I could erase all of this out right here. See that? Okay. And now with all of that erased out, okay, I'm going to turn off the channel. I'm back on RGB. You have to always touch RGB because if you don't, and you're on channel, you go back to your layer and you're like, where'd everything go? Well, it's not there, you're still in channel mode. You have to turn that channel off. You can't even turn it off until you go back and click RGB. Because RGB is the, is the color set of red, green, and blue that allows you to see color in Photoshop, okay? So if I go back to my layers right now and look, I, ha I have nothing there, I just have my line, right? So here, I have this empty layer here, number three. So watch, to load a channel, if I come back up here, so let's just say, I have my, my, my character and I'm working on him and I want to adjust the eye somehow. I go to select, okay? I come down here and um, load selection right there under select and it brings up the channel listing. If I click this channel, there's the one I just created called alpha one. Now I can label my channels. If I go back real quick, let me hit cancel. If I go back to my channels right here and I come down to alpha one, I can double click on this layer right here and I can call this the eye, right? And then I can come back, touch RGB, go back to layers, select, load selection. Oop, there it is, there's eye. So I could label different parts of my character by selecting the lines. That could save me a lot of time, right? So imagine, now I have a real simple character that you might not need to do this on, but imagine you're painting something complex where you have a backpack or there's textures. You don't want to have to go in and load the line all the time. You just load the channel. The channels are there. So this really is extremely helpful for me. And I'll cover this in the Viz Dev class when I get to an environment. Because now I can load highlights. I can load shadows. I can load everything from a channel in. And it's like ruby lift paper, which is the same principle back in my era in the 80s when we were airbrushing. We would take ruby paper and we would cut out as like mass paper. That's basically what a channel is, okay? But look what happens when I hit I, hit OK. There's my selection. So look, I can I could paint over it. I like to hide this selection. And what's really cool about hiding a selection is you could use the value of your brush, meaning that my brush right now is at 100%. When I paint over this, I get 100% read. Light's coming from one side. Let's say light's coming from the upper right-hand corner. Maybe I don't want the top of the eye to be super dark. So I want the eye to be lighter. So what do I do? I come in, I'm gonna hit three on my brush because I'm in B for brush. I hit three now and watch what happens when I color. It's lighter. And then I could come in like this. See, I can lightly build the color. See that, how cool that is? Then I could come over here and sort of darken the underneath of the eye. I can darken this part here. So look, let me hit hide again. I just have the selection there. That's it. Alea, you have a question. Can you also do that with a gradient too? Absolutely. In fact, here, let's delete what's there. Um, here, let me deselect. 
Sometimes it doesn't delete everything. I have to do it manually. Okay, there. That's selected. Actually, let's go in, just not to get off topic here. Let me select all right now. V, hit the move tool. I have my selection, right? Let's go to channels. I, I prefer to turn this off so I don't see it. Okay, now I'm going to go to channels. I'm going to create a new channel. So channels are just like layers. Okay, but they don't act like layers. I click a new layer. There it is. Okay, now sometimes, depending Mac or PC, you can hit delete, and it'll literally delete it right out of the selection for you, right? So now if I go to my turn on RGB, you see how I already have it there? I just hit delete. I have my line there. Whew, saves me a lot of time, right? Cool thing about this now is watch. I can duplicate this channel like so, right? So I just duplicated it. I'm going to come to my duplication real quick here, and let me see if I can do this pretty quickly here, okay? I'm going to take, this might take me just a little bit, just a minute or two. I'm going to erase all of this interior shape here. And the reason I'm going to do that is now I have another way of loading the outline of the character, and then I could use that outline to go in there really quickly and, um, and put textures in. By the way, I could create my own textures now on this character by doing this. I was going to show you this in the next step, but let's say I'm erasing part of him back here, and I want this guy to fade in a little bit. All my brushes apply in channels. So remember, I'm in black here, right? If I go to brush, if I come down here and click this spotty brush like this, there, you see how I'm creating a cool texture now? It acts like a silk screen. So when I go back and channel and paint over my character, that's going to be the negative space. The white space will be what is the color. That is incredible. And so when I do environments, that's an incredible way of painting textures for me. I can load up my textures every single time and paint on top of them. It's a fantastic way to work, okay? Here, let me, however though, let me come back to that. I'll show you that next step. I don't mean to be unfocused here. So let me just come back to erase. Let me see, I just want to go in here, erase all of this. Actually, I'm using erase when what I should be doing is using the brush tool and the white. Oh, look, my brush, why is it doing that? Because my brush is still set at 30%. So if I hit 100%, it's going to erase it completely, right? All right. Okay, so give me a second here. Let me just go along the lines here. And this literally, I know it seems like it could be time consuming, but you know what? This really doesn't take more if you get really quick at it and you have a road a Cintiq that rotates. I'm on a standard Cintiq here, right, that I can't rotate, so I have to, like, cock my arm at a certain angle. It really doesn't take too long to do this, and it's a really efficient way to add a lots of color and detail to your characters. Okay, give me one second here. Almost done. I really do prefer working on a Mac, though, because I'm used to the hotkeys on it at home. And when I'm here at school, I have this PC. Let me go along the edge here. Now, you'll notice I accidentally hit the edge right there. I went beyond the line of the character. You see that right there? So all I have to do is hit X, I change to the dark color, and then I come in here and I just went right over it. You see that? Simple, easy. Okay, hit X again, I'm back on white. Let's make my brush guy a little bit smaller here. And I know this is a lot of information to take in. That's why if you want, I could cover some of this information again with you guys. That's, you know, sometimes when I do a demo, this is stuff I've done and I take for granted. And then you guys get in there and you're like, whoa. Because what will happen is, actually, I've had this happen here. I tried doing a demo before on channels. And the PC here has some different preferences on it from different instructors than my Mac has at home. So sometimes the channels can sort of act a little differently or the way you're copying and pasting things, okay? So check it out. Now I have that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to come over here. I'm going to label this outline, okay? So then I made this other channel right here. That's line. So I'm going to, that's the line of the character, right? Just those three steps right there has just simplified and made your life 150% easier because this is why now, right? I can come back here, touch RGB. I turn that off. Let's come back to layers, right? So check it out. Watch how fast this is, right? I don't even need to do a line. I just need an empty layer right now. So I come over here, select. Right, load selection. Let's start with the base character of the color. So what's the base character? That's the outline. Okay, 
I'm going to imagine this guy is a light, um, a light pink. Okay, there it is. I'm just going to hit fill right now. Boom. Actually, Alea had that great question about a gradient. I take that color. I'm going to go a little bit darker. Okay, I'm going to hit G, put a gradient across. Bam. There's my gradient color right across, right? But I wanted the dark to be towards the feet. There we go. Gradient right across, right? Done. Hit Command D for deselect. There it is, right? Next one I'm going to do. Select. Go to load selection. Remember I put my line in there separate, right? Load selection. I called it line. Hit line. Hit OK. All right. Now I'm going to come in. Hit Control H to hide. Um, I could do that same thing. I just did another gradient on that. It's just a selection. I can do texture, I can paint, I can do gradient, I can do anything I want on it. It's a basic selection. Here, I'm going to come in here and I'm going to darken these colors in here because it's now the line. So I'm going to darken that one. Let's come to this guy, pull that guy down a little bit more. And then I have just the line selected. Go to gradient, stroke across, bam. There's my line of my character now. I did it in the wrong direction. Boom. There's part of my line. Okay. Now, What's the one thing I've done here that I shouldn't have done? They're all the same layer. That's right. It's all in the same layer right now, but I want to sort of test you guys. So I'm going to hit Command Z, take it off. So it's in your best interest to work in this simple method. You have three layers for your character. Okay, we already talked about the top one being the line. You have another one underneath. So I like to call this my base or my value. That's my base color of the character. Sometimes I call it my local, like my local color. Okay, so I end up having three more line uh, layers usually on my character. This one I usually call my texture layer. Okay, the next layer right above this I call my line. And sometimes I have one more layer un in there if I have time. And I might call this, I call it a blend or like a shadow layer, meaning that if I'm getting in there and I want to have any darks that are like blended together. Okay, so. Here, let me go ahead on this one. I'm just going to call this my blend layer. All right. So here are my three layers right now. I don't need any of these. These others were from the early demo. I would delete these. Let's go ahead. I'll just leave them there in case I need them. Yeah. So those are the four you need for painting a character. That's it. You don't need any more. Don't go layer crazy. I mean, you might have one or two for details. I might have another one for the eye or the color of the eye. But stay simple. So now I go to my line layer, right? I hit deselect. So I come back to select here. Load selection. I come right over here, let's go to the line, hit OK, come back to G, hit Control H. I never like looking at that selection, it confuses me. I'm going to do a gradient across, and I want the gradient in the other direction, boom, that's done. What's so great about me doing that is now that it's on a separate layer, deselect, I can go to levels anytime. See that? And I could darken my line any way I want. And not only can I darken my line, I could select parts of my line because it's on a separate layer, right? So if I decide that that eye isn't quite dark enough, I can come in here with my selection tool now and select, doing this with a mouse, so bear with me if it's not all accurate. There, I selected that part of the eye. It's on a different layer. I go to levels and I just come in here and look at that. I just darkened a little bit of the eye, right? Really fantastic, simple, easy. So next approach here. The next approach here is then, let's say, let's deselect. Let's say I want to come in and put textures. I want to come in and put some kind of, of funky blended texture on my character and mess with them a little bit, OK? Well, this is where brushes is a huge advantage, right? Now, one of the things that might suck is if I come in here, so in my brushes down below here, I have a bunch of texture brushes already set up. So let's say I come in here. I'm going to take um, a brush like this, and I'm going to start. Now, when I do, th these are my brushes for painting. When I do a texture brush, I like to go into the presets and put it on jitter and angle, and then also put it on transfer. And I create a new brush preset, because then when I stamp it, when I stamp this brush right now, what happens? See that? It's spinning, because it's on a jitter. It's on a move control. Some of my brushes don't do that. So some of my brushes, like this one, I don't know if this one rotates or not. Yeah, just a light. See, it, it stays sort of light in its rotation. It's really basic, OK? So sometimes you can make hold separate brushes or adjust your brushes really quickly. Remember, in brush presets, if you click open a brush right now in a preset, OK, so if I come over here to a brush preset and I open this and I grab that brush, if I change it, that doesn't 
save the brush. I have to tell it to be a new brush preset in order to save the changes. Once I click off of that brush preset and go back, it's back to the way it was saved. Okay, but that's brushes, whole another value. But the great thing about transfer is see transfer allows me to go from thick line to light line inside my color range there. That's really important. Okay, all right, so let's just go back here. Here, I'm just gonna pick a couple, couple uh, textures here. Let's start with, um, here I have a couple right here. And let's say in my textures, I wanna go maybe red, but a little bit more orange looking, right? Okay, now one of the things that's gonna happen when I start doing my textures on top of my character right now, uh-oh, it's not quite orange enough. There we go. Is what's happening is I'm throwing some textures around my character. It's going outside of the selection. That means I gotta go back and clean all that up. That's a total hassle. But remember what I did before? is in, in the, when I created my channel, I made a separate channel for just the shape of the character. That's what I fill the character with. So I'm just gonna come back here, go to select, right? Load selection, and there's my outline. So I'm just gonna select outline. Now the whole character is selected again. I don't have to worry about overspray. I just hit control H to hide. And now I could come in here and I can just start sort of tapping on some textures. Do you see that? I don't have to worry about anything else. I can texture on my character. Now, just to quiz you, what's the mistake I just did? I'm on the line layer. I'm not on a separate layer, right? A couple steps back. That's why the one thing to remember about coloring characters, it's really great if you have the option to come in and you have line separate blend texture base. So now I'm on texture, and this is why this is important, is since it's on a separate layer, I can adjust the hue and saturation, I can adjust the color, I can make any selection on that. If you put it all in one layer, you're screwed. You can't do all that. Okay, so now I could come in here, and I could actually, that's a little dark, I'm gonna push up and let's just throw some bright little speckles on my guy. Like that, right? And I might look at that and be like, whoa, okay, that's cool, he's different, right? But Again, I don't like it right now. Let's come back to that. It's a layer. I just turn it off. I come back to it later. So now let's come back. Let's talk about blend real quick here. All right. Let's say I want to put some shadows on my character. We have a couple different ways we can do shadows. One is I could come down to my base layer right here, and I could take the lasso, and I could pretend light's coming from the left side, right? Now, I could take my lasso here. I'm just taking the standard lasso, and I'm going to select areas. So light's coming this way. And let me draw that for you. Actually, I can't. I don't know if I can draw it because I, light's coming this way towards my character, okay? So what I'm gonna do is go to my lasso right now and I'm just gonna, um, here, uh-oh, deselect, there. So I'm gonna select a shadow right in here, do you see that? The shadow of his eyelid. Um, where else might be shadow? On the corner of his teeth, okay? I might have, there might be a little bit of a shadow under his body base right here. with his feet in there. I'm doing this really quick. I could be a little bit more careful in my selection, but here, I'm just trying to do it super quick, right? There, I'm just come in here real quick. There we go. So there, there's part of my selection. Now, down here, I might have a shadow underneath him here, okay? Um, there might be a little bit of a shadow under the base here. Might be a little shadow there. Maybe a little bit of a shadow sort of right in there. A little bit of a shadow back here. Now. What I can do really quick is I could literally, three ways to create those shadows. If I go to levels real quick, I'm on the base layer, I can just go like this and darken the shadow really quick, right? However, what happens if I do that? I can't change it. So it's in my best interest to do what? To put another layer right above that and then call that a shadow layer. Okay, select the color that you like. Okay, so go to brush. Come over here, open up your color picker, select that color, and then just move it down and go a little bit darker. Okay, now by doing that, I have multiple options. I can hit it with a gradient, I can do it with brushes, I can go light to dark, I can come in your opinion however I want. So since light's coming that way, I'm gonna hit Control H, I have it on a shadow layer now, right? I could come in here and do this. So I might like 
paint a little bit dark and then like lightly blend it over. See that? A little dark, let's say. Put my brush on like three, go really light and then darken it down here a little bit more. And then I might decide like, oh hey, you know, let's, um, I want a little bit darker, a little bit richer. Let's move it over this way. So now I might come in here. See that? Just put a little bit of a dark end on that side. You know, shrink my brush down, try to get underneath here. Get a little bit of a dark corner in there, maybe in there. Look at the feet, let's say. There, do you see how quickly? I'm, but I'm thinking smart. I'm not doing it all in one layer where I can't go back and change anything. All you really need are like four layers to get through this, okay? Then remember, uh, so that's sort of my shadow. Let me hit deselect. So I started putting a shadow on my character, right? Um, I could come in, let's put another layer up on the top here, okay? I'm gonna call this high. Yes, Anthony, you got a question? What do you think about uh, contrasting, temperature, contrasting the temperature of shadows with the character? Well, absolutely, but that's more of a painter thing. Oh. So when you're in painting your character, yeah, I mean, if your character is yellow and you go in and start to put a little bit of a shadow of blue, you know, like when we looked at Christina's stuff, she does that all the time. That's, but that's more it's of... It's not as important for this... Well, it's up to you. It's, but that's, you're getting more into rendering and color and blending then. That's more of a painting thing. That's a painting choice. In today's demo, I just want to give you guys the basics of how to use selection, how to change line color, and how to use channels to your advantage to color something. So, Because I could get in this thing, and I could start painting and rendering, but it's going to take me an hour and a half yeah. to do, right? So, I mean, in fact, speaking of that, let me just go really quick here. Um, and I'll, I'll put this link up for you um, back under... Let's go back to YouTube, right? Let's go to the block site really quick. Because um, I think we're already at like 40 minutes, right? So here, let me go fills design corner. But see, the difference is, is that's rendering. So rendering and painting, that's a whole nother can of worms. So look, if we scroll down here, um, actually, let me go to my fills design corner here, okay? Um, and if we scroll down here, I did this back in the character design one class, but it's still a good demo. It's just, this is a little different from, this demo is a little bit different for that. That's a rendering demo. And I have no problems doing, getting into that. It's just gonna take, you know, it's, it's another hour or something to get in there. So let me find it real quick. Oh, come on, there it is, down here. So down here, I did something about, in this demo, you know, I talked about starting with shapes. See, now I'm rendering though, I'm putting on highlights. I'm going dark light, I have textures in there. So I mean, this demo right here is, you know, I'm talking about making little selections and I don't even have much of a line. I'm just working with shape in here. But look, it's that's 40, going on 35 minutes of time for that one little demo, okay? So um, that's more of a rendering thing, which could be a great demo to have as separate, is how do I render my character, get into that finished stage, right? Absolutely. But, All right, guys, welcome back. We can talk about uh -oh. the character I'm still design talking. assignment. This is the second time I'm doing this because I'm pulling my hair out right now. All I'm right. really frustrated. Okay? <laughs> so All right. that was my rendering. Stop. Why is it still? Is, uh... Oh, yes, my voice is no longer there. All right, so, um, but what's really cool, what I didn't show in part of that is I was just painting with shape and doing textures and stuff. What's really, do you see how important channels on the line is right here? Is there's a certain setup that you do because look, now I have all this separate here. So let's say this was my character. Remember I had the texture on here, let's go back. I was putting some texture in there. It's on a separate layer now. So yeah, that's obviously way too bright, but now I can go into an eraser and I could start erasing part of that. Not only eraser, there's something else really cool that's a huge benefit for you guys. The smudge tools, however though, the smudge tools can be, so if I click on that little hand, you might see this, the blur option, but if you come down here and you hit smudge for R, there are some, I have some custom smudge tools that are here under that hand that you can find. Some people have loaded some online, there's different variants, but you can now use brushes in smudge. So look, see those little orange dots everywhere? I could come in here, select one of my brushes, remember, Every one of my brushes has a different feel to it, right? A different softness or hardness. So if I select this brush now, I could come over here and see, I can smudge and blend, blend part of that texture around. Now this is where you have to be careful. If you have an older computer or a crappy laptop, 
and you're doing a lot of smudging, it will lock up the machine because the computer is having to process those pixels. And you're sitting here and you're just like all, oh, yeah, I'm smudge happy. Now watch what happens if I smudge for a while here and I stop. See this, the pinwheel of death come up? Okay, on a Mac, it'll lock up like that because you gave it too much commands and like Photoshop gets lost and you look over on the side and you realize you haven't saved your file for 25 minutes or 30 minutes and then you just lost everything. Okay, so there's a certain benefit for this. I do this all the time for textures and environments and stuff, but look, it, it's also pretty scary. And then I have these other, so look, it's still, I have these other tools, which are really cool. Uh, there's this one in here called Smudge Nice. See this? That really allows me to like literally blend something in too. And I like this tool a lot because it also has a strength setting. And so if I go down to like 10% right now, See, it's just pretty light. So now I'm taking part of my texture and I'm smudging it into his skin color just to make him look a little different, right? See, before it was too strong. Now it, that texture is starting to be like, hey, that could be like a cool little painted texture on part of my guy. And then I could come in, I could do the white, I could do the eye, I can get this, and I could start rendering him. But then the benefit of all this is look at the structure. I have a base color, I have a shadow color, Okay, and then even my shadow, let's say I look at that and I'm like, yeah, but Phil just did the same color. I want it to be more blue. Well, it's on a separate layer. I can go to color balance. I could come over. I can select this as a shadow. I can go to blue. And look what happens to the shadow. I can put a little bit more blue into it. I can put a little bit more cyan so it feels a little bit more bluish in color. All right, I can get something going like that. I can adjust the layer setting on it. See, I can tone it down a little bit. That's huge. That's a huge advantage for me to change in my color and to render because everything's on a separate layer. Where I can't help you and where you're going to have a hard time is if you go in and paint everything on two layers. All right. So th there's a time for that. To be honest, the best time to paint everything on like two layers, which is just line and color, is when you're doing like blending, where I'm blending multiple colors. Okay, so what, what do I mean by blending? Let me do it over here on the side. Okay, if I'm working right now, and if I have a brush, let's say, this is what I mean by blending. Let's say I'm at like an eight here. And I'm going from this here, and then I'm gonna go to a richer red here. Okay. Now what, hold on a minute. I should be doing this on another layer, because this layer is at 62%, okay? So, and then let's say I'm going to like uh, an orange. Oops. Okay, so what I mean by blending is that I need those colors to transition to each other. So I do that by taking one of my painterly brushes and then I might drop down to like a two or three. So there's two ways to do this. Let me show you. First, let me select this. Let's copy this, let's delete it because it looked horrible with that blue super bright, right, on my character. And then I'm gonna create another layer right above it here. I'm gonna paste this back in. I'm gonna bring it to the side. So imagine if this guy was like part of my color. And this, you could do this too. You could paint him on the side. Why? You have the outline selection. And then you could drop it underneath. You could, you could start using layer effects of multiply, overlay, soft light, and have different variants, right? But here's what I'm talking about with blending. I have two ways to blend this color right here. Let me paste another version right here. These are the two ways that I could do it. It's on one layer now, okay? First way is where I have to take the brush itself and I have to come in here and try to find a happy medium between the two. So if I take that yellow right now and I drop my brush down to about a 20 and I stroke it over on top, I just created an orange. After I create that orange, I then want to come over, swab that and see, and then sort of blend that in the middle here like this. And then with a little bit of going back and forth, doing this a couple times, I start to get a little bit of a soft transition. I'm even gonna put my brush down to like 10% now and try to get this transition of color going in between there. To see how that's happening now? That's the first approach to do it. The second approach to do it is the smudge option. The smudge actually takes a matter of seconds. So if I come back over and if I go to my smudge option here, right? Um, let's actually let's do it two ways here. Let me duplicate that layer and I'll bring another version down below here. Okay, so the first one I'm going to go to smudge again 
But this time in smudge, what I'm going to do is I'm going to select a, a, just a different brush. So remember, I have my brushes sort of labeled. I have painting, and I come down here, and I have a brush that's uh, texturing, or let's say even clouds would work good. I can pick a cloud brush. Um, this one works great. So now what I'm going to do, so let's put my brush at 100% and see what happens. Actually, maybe my cloud brush is not working that well. Oh, that's why. I'm on the wrong layer, dummy. Let me merge those there. So now if I come across here, whoa, that didn't really do it, right? It's just smudging all the color. All right, so that might be the particular preset of the brush versus here, let me try another brush. Let's go up here. Let's see what happens on this texture brush. So that's not really, that's doing a little bit more, but not quite. However, though, I have a couple of these brushes that I was given by a couple students. Look at that. That's beauty right there, folks. That's one or two swipes. And ready for this? I have there's other versions of these. Scratchy. Oh, yeah. Got oil, baby. Look at that. It's got a scratchy feel to it. It's a blending brush. I come over here. Um, the two I really like on this are the, the Pebble. The Bristol's OK, too. Because sometimes I can even push the color out a little bit more. See that? But that's major lag right there. My pen isn't even on the tablet right now. That was a five second lab lag, five to seven second lag, and this was a pretty powerful machine, this box tech machine. So watch what happens. Let's see if I can crash it. Uh oh, pinwheel of death. Oh, it's still going. I'm not on the monitor. Oh, it's still going. See, that's the only downside to smudging. But look at how cool those smudges are. Okay, I can give you guys these smudge brushes today. So if I come down here, go back to smudge nice. Now remember, I can control the percentage, right? The strength. So it's like a brush. So you got to go back and forth. So now I can come over here. Remember, okay, what if I want a light smudge? 10. See how cool I can blend these colors together now? Boom. That took me a whole second versus... Now here's the thing about smudging. This sort of looks better right here, doesn't it? That looks a little better in the middle because I was able to take my time and use my eye and go back and forth between altering my brush percentages and swabbing colors and get that blend to work. But what's really cool about all this is I can now take this guy right here, okay? It's on a separate layer. My line's up above. I can move this over. And look, I could put him under my character. I could transform this. I could stretch it out. I could blend, if I wanted to, part of that texture into this. Now, I haven't met the guys at CreatureBox yet, but I guarantee you, when you're working inside, they use Sketchbook Pro, which doesn't have the same amount of brush control as you do in Photoshop. You can create brushes in it, but I know that they are using layers and blending them over each other. So that's a whole nother demo right there, because look, with this done, look, I can come in here, deselect, oops, cancel, deselect, erase. I can get this erase over my guy here like so. So look, I could, that means I can create different textures. I could come in here, I can drop the value down of this texture to something that I might like. Let's say that I like that look on him. Then I could just drop that into the shadow layer by merging them both together and boom, now it's one. I could still come in. See what I'm getting at here? Okay, now, again, all you really have to do is do, you know, a thin black line, local color, and so on. So let, let me touch on that really quick. Uh, rendering can be, that's a whole other video because there's so much, many other things to talk about there. Because in rendering, you have the local color of the object. We also have the color of the light that's casting on that changes everything, right? We can get really specific about that. So let's just stick, if I had to do like a quick presentation, remember we saw David Coleman's work, okay, where he just had line and a really simple value underneath. That's all you need sometimes to get your characters to pop and to work, okay? It's just better than having white, white on black, right? So remember my lines here? Um, I could easily go into my line, and this is a common practice, is a lot of students will take the line and they'll have it sort of darkened like this and let's say I have a let's say my base colors in here let's say they have something like this and that's actually not bad once I got my eye color in there 
painted white and paint the eyes and stuff. But what students will do is they come back to the line and they start erasing parts of the line to thin it down. And you could totally, the reason why you can do that in the way I showed you today is you still have the channel. You could load the channel at any time and darken or change that. So you could come in here, um, that line's pretty thick, right? So look, I'm on the line itself. I can go to erase. I can drop down to about 30%. And I could come in here. So I have a highlight hitting this side. That line is really light there. I'm going to start just really lightly coming in here and thinning part of that line down thinning part of this line down, okay? I'm gonna drop down to like 10% even on my brush. It's just three swipes is 30% off, right? So I could really start to adjust part of that line over there. And then of course I can also manipulate it like so, okay? So, is that, any other questions on that? You, so the rendering part comes back to you but you don't have to render it something. So remember, just before I finish up this demo, I mean, what I would recommend for you to do, I wouldn't just sit down without having examples. You know, I think that's what's, what's great about looking at, you know, looking at Daniel's work right here. That's like, there's a, you could see the texture in there. He put the texture really quickly in there with a brush. The line's very light. So, you know, it, it, it's, all of this comes down to some of your work method too. So you, we looked at Maddie's work, right? I've seen Maddie work before. She works in Sketch Pro or Photoshop. She cleans up her line, has her line as a separate layer, brings it in, can change the color, put simple colors underneath, boom, that's it. Okay, you, we were looking at David Coleman. So, you know, when we look at those, um, those options for you guys, that's just tone. I, I don't want you to do just tone at least select one side and darken it a little bit so it looks like there's a light side and a dark side, right? But if I was doing rough characters for a studio project and I was going to show something, I would definitely do just my first pass on silhouettes for thumbnails. You guys as my students bring in silhouettes and stuff and just gray, but I like to do something like this. I just throw a basic color in there and get it to pop off the page. Why? He's creating contrast between a white page with a little bit of light brown, and it makes the characters pop off a little bit. So my recommendations for you, because I, I don't want to sit here and render for an hour, right? I can in another video, is go find somebody's style that you like and look at that style as you're working. That's your first step. Your next step is, is use channels correctly, always keep your line layers separate, and then do those other four layers that I had. You have a base color, you have a texture color, you have a blend color, you might have a dark, this was the darks, okay? You might have a dark layer and then you might have a highlight layer. That way if there's anything you need to change, you can change it very quickly. But I think you guys saw the benefits of using channels. And here's the other thing about channels, is let's say I'm in my character and I wanna put some type of texture on him really quick, right? Um, all I have to do is come back to channels right here. Okay, that's the outline. Look, I can grab this and drag it or right click on it and duplicate it. I could duplicate it right now like this. And here's the crazy thing is that I can come back in here. Let's turn on the Ruby lift. Okay, oops. So now I can see the Ruby lift. Now what I don't like about this is the color showing underneath. You see that? So what I'm gonna do is go back to layers and take off all the color on my character real quick. So when I go back to channels, I can see just the channel itself, okay? Now, I have that selected, I have that on. So look, I switch to black right here and I could start doing all kinds of like weird, oops, textures. I could put like rough textures here. I don't know, let's just come in and put some textures across. My brush is really low, it's only at 10%, right? Let's go to 40. I might put some weird textures there. Let's take a cloud, put a little weird cloud. He's got some fuzzy head, whatever. He's got that. And since I duplicated that, I could load that now and paint it. And here's the best part, you ready for this? Duplicate the layer. Okay, it's right here, this channel. Turn it on. And now watch, control I, I just inversed it. I swipped everything. So now the parts I painted will be the highlights on there. You see that? And that took me like seconds. I just, 
I took that channel which was outline and I'm going to label it so I don't forget. I'm going to call it outline texture inverse. So now that I have that there, let's turn that guy off. Let's go back to RGB, turn off the channel, come back to layer here, put a couple of these. Um, let's say, yeah, let's put, let's just go back to this, right? Select, load selection, okay? Outline texture inverse, put a uh, layer above it. See, it put, those are now highs. So the areas I was painting in, remember positive and negative, right? And when I inversed it, those became the highlight points. So I hit control H. So if I wanted to come in here, let's say I was gonna have some like weird highlights. I wanted to get on my character real quick. See that? They're right in there. But I inversed it, so that means I've lost the outline to them, but that's okay. I could just quickly erase it, but see how I can use that for texturing? It's a huge advantage in my work. As now he has this cool little texture that took me a matter of seconds to put in just by inversing a layer. So what's cool about that is sometimes in channels, when I've worked for a good example of this, I, I don't know if you can relate to this, but I had to do a wall once, I had to paint this wall, and I just grabbed a brick texture, put the brick texture into the outline, painted it, but then my buddy made a comment about, well, the brick motor doesn't look right. So I took the channel, inversed it, so then it would only be the brick mortar, and then just painted in the brick mortar sort of different darks, and there it was, it was done. Okay, so real quick, let me stop the demo because I'm worried I could crash it. I know we've been talking for a while. Um, where is it? <laughs>